an election for the history books. Thank you for a historic landslide victory. This election proves what Ronald Reagan famously said, the Latinos are Republicans. Florida turns red by stunning numbers. For Florida Democrats, an autopsy. We need to organize and we need to realize that you can't just go, oh, Florida is done, let's walk away. The lessons and a look ahead. Our city, our team, FTX, UMA. In, now out, a sudden crypto crash. Public funding and the Miami heat among the losers. Implosion. An historic building gone, what will take its place? The big news of the week, all live this week in South Florida. Good morning, glad you could join us. I'm Michael Putnam. I'm Glenna Milberg, and as we come on the air today, Florida is seeing red. Some Sunday morning quarterbacking and a look ahead coming up this hour, but first happening right now, the demise of an historic building, and at the same time, the demise of a plan for progress. We're going to take you out to Miami Beach where the demolition of the Doville Hotel got underway. It happened this morning. Started with some booms and a whole lot of shaking going on out there at 67th and Collins. Trent Kelly was there for the implosion and he joins us now live with a report. Trent, has it settled down or is it still dusty out there? Well, uh, Michael, I can tell you most of that dust has dust has now settled, but uh, just behind me, you can see the big debris pile that is left over. That is where the Deauville Hotel once stood. It had been here since the mid 50s, the building gaining a national following after the Beatles made just their second TV appearance here just a few years later. But the site, as you mentioned, has not been without its fair share of controversy. After shutting its doors back in 2017 due to a fire, the owners of the old hotel basically let the building sit vacant for the next five years, where it continued to rot and deteriorate to the point where officials ultimately deemed it an unsafe structure. Now, while Dolphins owner Stephen Ross did recently announce plans to redevelop the site into several luxury towers, the status of those plans now in limbo. That's after a voter referendum that would have cleared the way for that project ultimately failed in last week's election. So where does that leave us today? Well, now that the demolition has taken place, the cleanup of this old historic site can now officially get underway. But what will go up in the Doville's place still remains to be seen. Reporting from Miami Beach for This Week in South Florida, I'm Trent Kelly, Local 10 News. Thanks, Trent. And in fact, one Miami Beach commissioner was very instrumental in opposing that vote. Kristen Rosen Gonzalez will be with us here live at uh, in this hour. Now, the biggest story of the week was, of course, the midterm election. The marquee races for governor, senator, they went to the Republicans. A red political tide was running in Florida. That has many saying that the state has moved from a swing state to a red state. But has it? Well, the answer to that appears to be yes for the foreseeable future. Florida Democrats' uphill climb is now even steeper. Election night gave Republicans a supermajority in both chambers in the legislature and a juggernaut governor who swept to re-election with historic numbers. For the first time in recent history, Miami-Dade County voted for a Republican governor. The poor showing by Democratic candidates almost across the board around the state has led for calls for the resignation of state party chair Manny Diaz of Miami. And this morning, he blamed the National Party for failing to provide any money. We invited Mr. Diaz to be a guest on the program. He declined. So how do Democrats plan to have a say in the direction of the state? What is the plan? <laughs> state Rep Fentress Driscoll is a Democrat from Tampa who is the House Minority Leader designate incoming Fentress Driscoll, great to have you on This Week in South Florida. Congratulations on your re-election. And uh, you now have one of the toughest jobs in Tallahassee. Good morning, Glenn. Thank you so much for having me. And don't worry, I'm used to tough jobs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. let's um, let's start out then by saying, you know, you uh, I don't know you well, but we've met. You strike me as a really positive person. What What is the initial plan? 
Well, you know, I think there are a few things we have to remember. First of all, Democrats have been in the minority for quite some time in the Florida legislature and certainly in the Florida House. So we know how to do this. We know how to continue to speak for the people who sent us there to speak for them. And so we will do that. We will continue to get the job done. We will focus on those issues that matter most to Floridians, uh, including, you know, access to affordable, high quality health care, making sure that we focus on affordability, uh, whether that's a, a affordable housing or also trying to bring down the cost of property insurance insurance and keeping our community safe from gun violence. We will continue to focus on all of those things. But at the same time, we have to figure out how to get that message out to voters better. We do great work. We have great people and great policy ideas. But I think what this election showed us is that we have to do a stronger job of getting that message out to the people. Yeah. Uh, Fentrose Michael Putney here. We're meeting for the first time. Great to have you on our show. Great to speak with you. So about the leadership of the Florida Democratic Party, it's changed, I think, five times over the last couple of years. Uh, and Manny Diaz, a, a friend of ours from Miami, former mayor, has been the, the, the chairman. Uh, but I, I just, you know, you've heard these calls for his resignation. Should he resign as the chair? Well, I think the structural issues that exist in the party right now existed before Chair Diaz and they will exist after Chair Diaz unless we come together as a party and get some plans together around two things. The first is partisan voter registration and the second is year round engagement in communities across the state and particularly in communities of color. That is what we have to solve for regardless of who's chair. Well, one of the things that came out of Tuesday night that and I think surprised a lot of people is that fewer Democrats voted this year than in 2018. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was a, I want to talk more about what Chair Diaz had said in a memo to party leaders, basically what you just said about money and engagement. But wh where was the engagement in, in certain communities, if you can pinpoint, and with so much on the line this time and so much division, what do you what do you expect happened to make them not turn out? Yeah, I mean, I think that our national partners certainly let us down in terms of not investing in Florida. And Florida is a state that you have to invest in. When you look at our prior statewide races, they've all been close except for this one. So then that makes me think, okay, what was so different about this one? Well, the difference was Governor DeSantis. He had a $200 million war chest. He spent about $100 million of it. This was the most expensive gubernatorial race in American history. And so the Democrats, yes, we put up the best fight we could with the resources that we had. But when you're getting outspent 10 to 1, it almost doesn't matter, you know, what you try to do. In, in politics, you certainly don't have to have the most money, but you need to have enough resources to be competitive. The other thing is, when you look at Governor DeSantis and his policies, he, in my opinion, has been such a divisive figure in Florida politics. He uses these boogeyman issues, whether it was the don't say gay bill, or he drives these wedge issues like abortion, when really that's not what Floridians need, right? Like people are concerned with kitchen table issues and they're concerned that their rent is going higher, property insurance is way too high. And somehow he has this Teflon where he's able to avoid owning those failures and he does need to own those failures. He has been the governor for four years and has done nothing about those two issues. But he focuses on those social issues that drive Floridians apart. I think it had an impact on the Democratic base. I think people felt discouraged and demoralized. And in that, to that extent, his plan worked. Can I, can I just, um, can I just yeah. push, push back on... One thing you said, I, I heard the governor talking about those kitchen table issues and, and blaming the Biden administration for the economic failures. I think that was the message that I heard. I think in South Florida and probably in your neck of the woods too, in the Tampa area, whenever the governor or, or any of the Republican leaders would speak, the message was about freedom, free state of Florida. And people hear freedom in different ways, obviously. Uh, he pushed freedom from COVID restrictions or freedom from socialism when he speaks in Miami. But, but that was, I think, a defining message that we find on the campaign trail where it looked like Democrats really had, you know, abortion for a time, and certainly Charlie Crist made that his priority. Um, I'm wondering if you think that the, that kind of messaging really missed the mark this time. 
Well, that's what's so unfortunate, because if you were to speak to any of my members, the members of my caucus in the House, they will tell you that Florida Democrats believe that every Floridian deserves the freedom to be healthy, prosperous and safe. We've made a concerted effort with our messaging around that because freedom is not an ideal that any party owns. Right. It's an American ideal. We talk about that freedom in terms of good policies to make people's lives better. And what I mean by DeSantis kind of having this Teflon, you know, he says freedom from COVID restrictions. Everybody forgets that Ron DeSantis has also shut the state down. He, st he shut our bars down. We had COVID restrictions as well. When he eased up on those restrictions, the only reason that I think the state made it through is because there were brave local uh, county commissioners and mayors who did have some mask restrictions in place to try to keep us safe at the time when uh, the COVID-19 um, pandemic was raging. So I, I do think that Democrats have been talking about freedom. Somehow Republicans seem to have a louder message than we do. But again, they tend to win the, um, the war of propaganda. One last note to make, you know, it's so interesting that they have been blaming the Biden administration for this. First of all, the inflation uh, uh, issue that we're experiencing nationally is not just unique to America. It's an international issue. Mm -hmm. The second point is that Florida's economy was really in the trouble and in, in trouble. We were facing a budget deficit of over $10 billion, I think, in the state until uh, President Biden sent federal resources down and allowed us to have the largest budget in history. So a lot of this credit that Governor DeSantis has been claiming is, in fact, due to Joe Biden sending federal dollars here. And I don't think a lot of people realize that. Yeah. Uh, Fentress, let me ask you to look ahead for the next uh, legislative session where you will be the leader of the House. The state Senate president uh, designate has already said that she is going to introduce a bill, a heartbeat bill that would create a limit for an abortion at six weeks. Uh, yeah. do, number one, do you expect that to happen? And number two, what will you and the Democrats do to try to stop it? Well, yeah, I do expect it to happen, whether it's six weeks or 12 weeks. And we tried to warn the people of Florida about this and try to uh, try to hold our Republican counterparts accountable because we knew that they would do this, but they refused to talk about it during election season because they know that it's unpopular with voters. And in every place in the country where we saw abortion explicitly on the ballot, including Kentucky and Kansas, which are far redder than Florida, the voters rejected it. So they're trying to sneak it in now because they know that it would be unpopular with Floridians. I think they should really exercise caution because that just might be the type of overreach that is their undoing. In terms of what the Democrats will do, we'll do what we always have, which is to try to, uh, you know, try to stop that bad bill from happening, try to put on some amendments where we can to try to soften the bill and make it less harmful to the people of Florida. But should this happen, this really is something that the people of Florida will need to pay attention to because the Republicans are starting to show who they truly are. They do not care about your freedoms. In fact, they want to further restrict them and take them away. Yeah, well, we will all be paying attention. And we thank you this morning for your time. You're a big star in Tampa. Now you're sort of getting to be a big star <laughs> in South Florida. Great thank to you. have you. Thanks very much, Ventress. Thanks, guys. The red wave included money and organization and leadership in what pollsters call the Hispanic vote. Governor DeSantis swept the Hispanic vote in Miami-Dade County, won a majority in Broward County as well. Did not do quite as well among Puerto Rican voters in Central Florida. They mostly gravitated to Charlie Crist. We want to talk about all this with two experienced political consultants. Fernand Amandi is a principal in Dixon, in Dixon Amandi International polling outfit there in Coconut Grove. He works mainly with Democratic candidates. And also with us for the first time, and we are glad to see him, is our friend Giancarlo Sopo, a Republican consultant, writer, analyst. He headed the Trump campaign's rapid response for Spanish media in 2020. Giancarlo. Fernand, great to see you guys. <laughs> great to be with you. AKA in the thick of it all. So let's start out with, um, you know, this is kind of interesting to me. So Giancarlo, Florida's red wave was actually an outlier nationally because even uh, the, ca the count isn't even done yet in some places, but in Michigan, there was actually a blue wave uh, around the country. It just didn't materialize, but boy, did it in Florida. What's that? Yeah, uh, Florida does appear to be an outlier in many ways. Uh, but one thing that I will say is that I do think the Republicans as a whole made very impressive gains with Hispanics across the country. In fact, according to the exit polls, Republicans just had their best performance ever with Hispanics in a midterm election, cutting the margins, the 40 point margin that the Democrats had 
in 2018, cutting them down to 21 points. But you're absolutely right. The results as a whole were pretty disappointing across the country. And I think the success in Florida, for if you're a Republican, can be attributed to having a strong governor and a strong senator in Marco Rubio, who ran on a uh, affirmative policy vision, not just opposing what's happening in Washington, but actually offering solutions, and voters rewarded them with their votes. Yeah. Uh, Fernando Mandi, an uh, old friend of mine. Uh, Fernand, uh, Ron DeSantis just trounced Charlie Crist in Miami-Dade County, uh, first time in 20 years that a Republican has won in the governor's race. And he, especially he won, I think, because he got the great majority of Hispanic votes. Why did they vote for him? Well, Michael, I must confess, I'm still a little bit triggered by you and Glenna opening the program with those images of the Dover Hotel being demolished because not only as a Beatle maniac, but as a Democrat, it's an apt metaphor for what Governor DeSantis and the, and the Republicans have done here in Florida. And, and for similar reasons, by the way, I mean, this is a case of here in Florida, at least, the Democratic Party's collapse because of demolition by neglect. It was only 10 years ago that uh, Barack Obama carried the state for the second time in a row, largely on the strength of overwhelming support from Hispanics, uh, a campaign that I was very much involved in. Giancarlo also an enthusiastic volunteer on both of those efforts. So it's been a huge reversal of fortunes. But you have to credit what Ron DeSantis and the Republican Party has done here. They've been engaged in a permanent campaign operation after the 2012 election when they could have given up they decided instead to reinvest double down their efforts as a party and they had that historic result i think the question is are these changes in florida permanent or are the democrats now going to try and implement a five to ten year plan to turn the reversal of fortune around here in florida for the upcoming cycles that's i think the question that all democrats in Florida and across the country are asking themselves, Michael, so, today. So don't you need money for that, though? And I, I don't know if you were able to hear our interview with Fentress Driscoll la in our last segment, but w I guess the question that I'd love to hear from both of you, what's the chicken and the egg here? Because money follows success and engagement and enthusiasm. And if there is none, well, there's not going to be money. But if there is no money, then how do you generate enthusiasm and engagement. So what, what is that chicken and the egg and why isn't it here? Glenn, Glenn, let me answer that because I think the key here is I'm of the opinion you cannot concede Florida. And here's the reason why strategically, if the Republicans feel that Florida is in their back pocket, the tens and hundreds of millions of dollars that they spend here every cycle will then be used to go on offense in other states where the Democrats are only winning by minor margins. So you've got to keep them on the defensive here. Also, I think this can turn around very quickly. How do I know? Because none other than Donald Trump, who uh, Giancarlo used to work for, has admitted Donald uh, Ron DeSantis is uh, an ineffective governor. He's Ron De Sanctimonious, and I think he is a poison pill that could very quickly split the Republican Party here in Florida and put the Democrats competitive again, particularly if the economic moves that the Biden administration made over these last two years that have created over 10 million jobs, that have lowered inflation, start to really come online and people feel the effects of that. So I don't think that money is necessarily gone for the long term. Yeah, but Giancarlo, you know well, you are a Miami native. Uh, you study these things. The Republican Party in Florida has 300,000 more registered voters now than Democrats. And just a couple of years ago, it was the reverse. I mean, the Republicans have outorganized, uh, outworked the, the Democratic, you know, machine, such as it is, not running very well. And, you know, the Republicans have got something going here. And I, whether, you know, I, I think that they're the possibility of them being in power. They've been in power in Florida for 15 years. I think that uh, the likelihood of them staying there is great, isn't it? Yeah, this is a great time to be a Republican in Florida. Uh, we just had a, a record performance definitely in my lifetime. I've never seen a 20 point uh, you know, a landslide like that in the Sunshine State. It's unheard of. Senator Rubio also did really well. I, I think Governor DeSantis's leadership combined with Senator Rubio's leadership, and then on a local level, when you see places in Miami like Maria Salazar, Congresswoman uh, from Florida District 27, who just won uh, by 15 points in a district that had been tied 
just a, just two years ago in the presidential. Yeah. I think that yeah. kind of Jane leadership Carla, just really me, attracts voters, in. and there's a lot of enthusiasm. Yeah, let, let, I'm sorry. Let me jump in and simply say uh, Maria Elvira won that race in large part because she stuck a label of socialist on her opponent, Annette Tadeo, uh, who is a center-left Democrat, but certainly not a socialist. But, you know, I'd say that's a lot of the reason why she won, wasn't it? No, I think she won because she's an effective bipartisan legislator. She's been rated as one of the most bipartisan leaders in Congress. She took some votes that maybe folks on Twitter didn't like, but that were very popular in, in her community. She's someone who's connected to her community. She has excellent constituent services. I, I think she learned a lot from our, our mutual friend, Congresswoman Ileana ross Layton. in that regard. You have to, if you're a Congresswoman or, or, or man, you have to be very close to your constituents. And her constituents love her. If you're ever out and about with her in South Florida, people gravitate toward her, want to take selfies. She's just very well liked. And that may be largely because she's been on television as a <laughs> broadcaster for half of her life. But we, let's talk about some more candidates. When we come back, we have to take a quick break. But I want to talk about some of the Democrats' candidates and, and what happened there. Stay tuned. We are back with Fernanda Mondi and Giancarlo Sopo, a Democrat, a Republican, pollsters. Can I call you political operatives? <laughs> you kind of are. Handicapping the midterms. I want to talk about the Democratic candidates, some of them. Fernand, take Val Demings for Senate. She is a congresswoman, a former police chief, a black woman who checks all the right boxes on the Democratic messaging points. Started out so strong uh, in polling against Senator Rubio. Same kind of with Charlie Crist in a way, the polling at the beginning, neck and neck, and then it all just kind of fell apart in the last two weeks. What happened to go from enthusiasm and inspiration to almost flatlining? What happened there? Well, I mean, Glenna, first off, there's no question. Initially, she checked a lot of the box that I know had a lot of Democrats enthused, not just here in Florida, but across the country. Part of the reason why she raised over $80 million in her campaign, not with a lot of support from the National Party, by the way, but really grassroots donors that felt energized by her candidacy. But it was a disappointing outcome. And I think you have to look at just the overall environment in the state. I've been working Florida politics for 25 years. For me, for the first time, on both sides, I might add, it didn't really feel like there was a campaign environment or atmosphere in Florida, certainly on the television advertisements. But beyond that, you just didn't really see the candidates engaging in the community, certainly not here in South Florida, which we knew was an area that Democrats had to do a lot better than in 2020. Well, so actually, they actually, in the last couple of days, the last week, she was here almost every day. That's way too late, Glenna. We're not an election anymore that's on election day in the last couple of days. Election month really starts all the way from October through November. By that time, voters have decided, voters have thought and made their case. And I think she needed to start it a lot earlier. But again, this is very interesting because there is a phenomenon happening, which Giancarlo acknowledges. Florida is an outlier. The United States electorate for three national elections in a row has rejected the Republican Party. So the question is, can that be exported out of Florida, which is now Mecca for MAGA? This is the MAGA state. Donald Trump lives here. Ron DeSantis lives here. They're not going to fight to the death to see who is King MAGA. But will that be exported? I think the answer to that is up in the air. Giancarlo, is, is Florida a MAGA state or just a Republican state? I think it's a Republican state. I think it's difficult to argue that uh, Senator Rubio is MAGA. Uh, and he, he just had an extraordinary election. He won by, like you said, by 17 points, despite being outspent. I think it's a very interesting question what Fernand raised, which is, can this be exported elsewhere? I think there are very promising signs. Look, according to the exit polls, both Governor DeSantis and Senator Rubio just won the Puerto Rican vote. Uh, that is unheard of in the Sunshine State. Uh, they also won other non-Cuban Hispanics. Uh, so, and the largest cohort among them are Mexican Americans and Colombian Americans, which there are plenty of uh, throughout the country, especially the former. I also think when you look closely at the exit polling, you see that both Senator Rubio and Governor DeSantis won hands down by about 30 point margins with white suburban voters, outperforming the national GOP ticket among that demographic group by about 10 points. I mean, look, right now what we're seeing in Nevada, where it looks like Adam Laxalt has lost, he only won white suburban voters by four. Republicans would love to have 
would love to be winning white suburban voters by 30 points all across the country. Yeah. Uh, Fernand, well, on Thursday night, uh, President Trump tried to pick a fight with Ron DeSantis, called him an average governor uh, with great public relations, and again said he wouldn't have been the governor in the first place if he had not, if he, Trump, had not endorsed him. And Governor DeSantis, I think wisely, has just sort of laid back, you know, has not responded. Uh, that will be his strategy, won't it? Oh, it's going to be even more than that. He's not going to run against Donald Trump, Michael. You don't think so? Donald, uh, I, there's really? no question. In my mind, uh, unless Governor DeSantis is not as smart as I think he is, because he'll turn him into low energy, uh, little Governor Ron DeSanctimonious in one second flat. And remember, Michael, the wing of the Republican Party that is, to my judgment, the dominant wing, the MAGA wing, in my judgment, it's a political cult. You can only have one political cult leader at a time. We saw what happened when Marco Rubio tried to run for president. He got destroyed within the Republican primary. He lost every county in Florida except Miami-Dade in the Florida Republican primary last time. So as long as Donald Trump wants the nomination and he's going to announce it on Tuesday here in Florida, it's his and DeSantis would not dare take him on because he'll get crushed. Well, and Senator Marco Rubio was on stage with former President Donald Trump on Sunday right here in South Florida. Yeah. Um, we we got to go, but you all are welcome back anytime, anytime. so we can, we can pick apart everything that happens <laughs> from now until 2024. Thank you so much. Giancarlo, Fernand, thanks so much. Great. Thank you. As we speak, the demolition of Miami Beach's historic Deauville Hotel is underway. That is video from about 8 o'clock this morning of the building coming, tumbling down. Its demise is the headline for a chronic South Florida story. Years of neglect by owners and ideas for an infusion of money in development that ended when voters opposed the changes. One Miami Beach commissioner led the charge against the upzoning that was needed for those changes and also against turning over city property parking lots off Lincoln Road to private developers. That commissioner is Commissioner Kristen Rosen Gonzalez. And there she is. Welcome, Kristen. Good to see you. Good morning. Good afternoon, whatever time it is right now. Good to have you aboard. So, um, you know, you, for people who might not live on or near Miami Beach, you pretty much single-handedly oppose this in a very loud way, framing it as David against Goliath um, and conflating a lot of the development projects that were underway when some say they were very different and should not have been conflated. What was wrong with this Deauville plan? Uh, Stephen Ross came in. First and foremost, thank you guys for having me on the show this morning. What happened with the Deauville is that there was very little public input. And we have a strong culture of historic preservation here on Miami Beach with the Save Miami Beach um, FAR movement in 1990, where we down zoned everything. So Miami Beach residents are not um, stupid and they are well informed. And we had a billionaire, a very powerful man, Stephen Ross, come in and he didn't really follow our public process. He didn't speak with the Miami Design Preservation League and all the other stakeholders. And he just came in supported by the mayor and said, we want this massive FAR increase. Right now you can build about 500,000 square feet at the Doval, and he was gonna almost double that. I think they were adding an additional 250,000 square feet. And first of all, they it was just too big, too dense. They took for granted the fact that uh, Miami Beach has never really uh, has never really voted in favor of FAR increases. So let me all. let me just um, let me just stop you for one second because you're talking about the project to come, when a lot of this discussion really should be what has happened to get us here, and the owners, the current owners. I, I hear, by and large, no argument that these owners allowed this property right. to deteriorate and have not paid any consequences for what is now a blighted city problem. And wouldn't the question be holding owners responsible for their properties and buildings so that we were not at this point um, to go forward? Is that, is that something that really needs to be scrutinized by all cities with this kind of issue. 
That is correct. The Merwelo family that owns the Delville property currently owes the city of Miami Beach $4.5 million in fines. We've been in court since uh, 2018. When Hurricane Ian hit in 2017, the, the Delville had an electrical problem and they shut it down and they just never fixed it. And within six months, the building was full of mold. And many years later, uh, with, with uh, by the way, commissioners pushing back, elected officials pushing back against an administration that we just couldn't seem to get anything done with the Doville, and it was really very depressing. And we've been in court with them. Uh, we went to the, the county structural board to try to fight this demolition by neglect, and I think Champlain Towers amplified everything. And today we saw a demolition by neglect. And thank goodness we won this referenda because what would the presumption have been after this or the precedent that now you can demolish the Raleigh Hotel or the Fountain Blue or the Versailles, any of our other famous hotels? People loved the Doval and there was an overestimation that people just wanted to get rid of an eyesore. But what our electorate really wants to see is the Doval renovated and some sort of new project that respects historic preservation in place. But and Commissioner, that isn't, that, isn't that indeed the consequence? Because right now the owners have no consequence. Isn't that the message, the exact message you don't want to send? Isn't, isn't that the message to developers or to owners that you can just let your property rot and here there is a developer no, coming in with they a were, plan they were that can't do it. Sorry? No, because they were defeated at the at the ballot box, Glenna. I mean, they have to go in front of the Historic Preservation Board now. Nobody can just go in there and develop whatever they want because in Miami Beach, we have a presumption of replication. Exactly. So now, I'm talking about isn't the message, to, to your point in the earlier question, isn't there a message to people who own properties now that you can get away without consequences and let your property sit there for as long as it needs to sit until property values rise and you can sell it without consequence for allowing that blight. That That is the message this destruction and demolition has just sent. It very well could be because an independent structural engineer went into the Doville and said this structure is unsafe and then we tried to fight it at the county structural board and they said and they, they refused it. So yes, this could potentially happen with other buildings. Um, and we just don't have any, and this is the post Champlain Towers world, world that we live in. And it's a very scary place for historic preservation. I keep reminding everybody that these historic buildings are our postcard. It's what makes us famous. It, what, it's what differentiates us from any other city in the world, from Tampa or Jupiter. I mean, people wanna come to Miami Beach because of these old historic buildings. And hopefully the judicial system moving forward will see that too, because we can't, ju judges are put in a very precarious place because you go in front of them and if they, if they vote to not demolish something and something happens, then that would be blood on their hands. But we can actually demand that they rebuild parts of the Dovo, that they rebuild well, these historic what, properties. Kristen, exp explain that. Through the Historic Preservation Board, you can now demand that somehow the Doville, the design, some or all of it be replicated? Yes, I mean, they can. And who's going to do that? Building, when an application is submitted, it has to go in front of the Historic Preservation Board. And it really does now all rest in the hands of a Historic Preservation Board. But we do have a presumption of replication, and that is that would have to be reversed by a court. So right now, they could demand that the Doville be rebuilt. And the Merwelos know this. And they're going to have to lower the price of this property, which they were planning on selling to developer Stephen Ross for $500 million. Um, they are not going to get that FAR increase. They are not going to be able to just implode and destroy the Doville with no consequences. There will be consequences for this. And we fought it. The city of Miami Beach has pushed back pretty hard. We've tried and yeah. failed. Yeah. It was well, a failure. well, it was a, a, a top-down effort to be sure, but then you sort of got your people together and you rose up against it. Steve Ross spent $1.9 million. You spent 30000 So. Congrats on a victory, but it's still unclear what's going to happen to that property. So anyway, Kristen Rosen Gonzalez, thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. The name on the FTX Arena, the home to the Miami Heat, is going to change. Miami-Dade is going to end the 19-year deal 
that was worth $135 million. The steep and sudden collapse of FTX cryptocurrency exchange this week, including bankruptcy, comes with financial fallout for the public and for the Miami Heat. In the span of about 24 hours, Miami-Dade Mayor Daniela Livinkava went from a wait and watch position, announcing the county is ending the arena naming deal with FTX. And she joins us right now live. Mayor, great to see you. Mary, Hello, welcome. We, we are glad you could join us. So what comes next? Who is going to get the, do you have a prospect for naming rights for the arena? We do not yet have a prospect, but the climate has changed substantially. When the last deal was negotiated, it was after a couple of years of no naming. Right. And um, we did our due diligence and we've collected $20 million on that deal and funded a major initiative, the Peace and Prosperity Plan. So definitely uh, we are very hopeful that in this market there will be others who would like to see their names up in light on the arena. So a question about that process because uh, it was uh, $5.5 .5 million a year is coming to the county and, and earmarked for the Peace and Prosperity Plan and for gun violence reduction and for uh, poverty programs, which are, uh, to your point, ongoing. And the next 5.5 million is actually due in January. So FTX and all its issues at the moment is not in arrears. So why break the deal before having another? So part of the contract says that if the company enters into bankruptcy proceedings, that uh, the deal can be terminated. So uh, we're just reading uh, what's going on. And we have to be aggressive in moving forward because we have an obligation to the heat to have a, a named arena. And uh, we, so we have to proceed uh, to explore other options. Yeah. Uh, Madam Mayor, let, let's move on if we can to another big story you're involved in this week. And that was your veto of this nearly 400 acre uh, industrial complex in Deep South Dade. Uh, beyond the urban development boundary line. Very briefly, why did you veto it? Michael, uh, no need, um, no demonstrated uh, benefit, and uh, bad for the environment, bad for our water supply, opposed by experts from federal to state level, including Senator Marco Rubio, the Farm Bureau, uh, many residents, and the commissioner of the district. So just simply not needed is the first thing. That's the threshold that the county planning department looks to. The availability of commercial land, industrial land within the urban development boundary meant that there was no established need for breaching this urban development boundary. You know, while we've been following this since the first of four deferrals um, and, and the process was very contentious, as you know, last week on this program, we had Commissioner Raquel Regalado, who was the vote that changed that allowed the supermajority for this to go through. And she brought up some some interesting things that I, I wish I had thought of at the beginning. And one of the things that she had said was, why do we take applications to move the line if we don't want to move the line, which I thought was a pretty simple question that I wish I had thought of. But why does the county even take applications if the UDB should be so set in stone? So the Community Development Master Plan, CDMP process, provides for exceptions. It provides for considerations. It's not set in stone, but need is the first requirement. And that simply has not been established. Um, the, the, there are too many compelling counter forces, countervailing forces to approve this application. It doesn't mean that other applications might not be considered. In fact, there are other applications pending that may be approved. Uh, so uh, coming up actually this week. So there's, uh, it, it, it is not fixed in stone and we have a planning department that advises us what's best for our future. And that is what this planning department did, an excellent job. And despite four times coming up with changes uh, based on hoping to persuade more commissioners, uh, the facts still remain. Yeah, you know, the argument, uh, Madam Mayor, by uh, Commissioner Regalado and by the developers is, look, we cut the project in half, 
We have made it, you know, as eco-friendly as it can be, and it will provide thousands of jobs, who knows how many, but a lot of jobs for people in South Dade who have to commute 30, 40 miles up north every day, one way and then back the other. So uh, what about that argument, the economic argument? So we do um, not have any guarantee of the jobs. We do not know what the project plans exactly are. Another requirement of the planning process when you're changing land use is to actually uh, say what you plan to develop. So despite the fact that there were developers present, uh, nobody said as to the bulk of this project what exactly it would include. There is legally no guarantee of the salaries uh, for the jobs. And we have a very low unemployment rate right now. So we don't know exactly uh, what the net benefit will be from an economic perspective. As far as scaling down the project, all the more reason we don't have a need because there exist within the urban development boundary, including in South Dade, space to create warehouses and commercial space. That is the general uh, proposal here. So why wouldn't the developers then look at those other areas instead of working so hard, including offering double the number of acreage mm -hmm. to replace this as part yes. of the deal. Well, why not go somewhere else? Did you ever sort of broach that with them? So we, the planning department, directly provided them information about alternatives. I cannot answer the question because we do not know exactly what is planned there. But I can imagine that this property will go up substantially in value as Commissioner Cohen Higgins described um, threefold, let's say, and that there's a huge profit to be made from flipping this property. So that is actually part of the concern. Planning needs to come with a specific proposal so that it can be evaluated. And in this case, there is uh, fear that this is a, a deal for speculation purposes. Yeah. Yeah. Mayor Levine Cava, we only have less than a minute left. Let me just ask you, this is going to come back before the Miami-Dade County Commission on Tuesday. For your veto to be sustained, uh, you've got to have one commissioner change his or her mind or one commissioner absent. What is your feeling? What's going to happen? I don't have my crystal ball clearly on this <laughs> one, but I have been working, as have many others, uh, including in government. Uh, agencies to to try to make sure that the implications, the uh, bad precedent setting is known to those who will be voting and trusting that they will realize that this is not the right time and place to right. move the urban development boundary line. All right. That is going to be the final word. We're so glad we could speak with you this morning. Thank you very Thank much, you. Madam Mayor. If you find your crystal ball, we'd like to use it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much to you both. To re-watch today's interviews or listen to the This Week in South Florida podcast, just go scan this QR code right there on your screen with your phone, and it takes you right to the This Week in South Florida section of Local10.com. As always, we thank you for being with us today, and remember, we are online, Local10.com, 24-7. And remember, as always, stay informed, get involved. Have a great Sunday.